Good afternoon, happy Wednesday, and good to have you once again here at the Columbus Metropolitan Club for another forum. Beautiful day, I know we wish we were outside, but it's good to be inside. I am Matt Barnes, morning co-anchor at NBC4 today, a proud member of your CMC Board of Trustees as well. And we also want to thank our generous sponsors of today's forum, Mary Haven Incorporated, the Problem Gambling Network of Ohio, and Taft Law. We also want to thank the Columbus Dispatch and the Ellis for their generous support for today's program. And we're also grateful to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting our live stream. Let's thank all of them for supporting today's forum. And like I said, this one should be a good one because it is time to place your bets, everyone. Sports betting for adults became legal on January 1st of last year, and it is now a $7.6 billion industry right here in the state of Ohio. That's $7.6 billion in just 12 months. That's both good and bad, right? Because that growth comes out of human costs. Calls to one support line for problem gamblers rose 150% in the first seven months of 2023, according to WOSU Public Media. And of course, the Super Bowl is coming up. There's gonna be a lot of sports betting, not just in Ohio, but all across the nation. So we're gonna dive into the impact of all that sports betting right here in Ohio, to ask who's winning, who's losing, and then what is next. And we are so, so happy to have such a distinguished panel uh, of experts here to talk about it. We have with us Dan Dodd, Vice President of Government Relations for ZHF Consulting, Stacey Farnapple Hassan, Chief of the Office of Prevention and Problem Gambling with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, Oyama Garrison, President and CEO of the Mary Haven Addiction Treatment Center, and Matt Schuler, Executive Director of the Ohio Casino Control Commission. I will now step aside and leave you in the very, very capable hands of Rob Aller, sports reporter and columnist of the Columbus Dispatch. Rob. Thanks for being here. This should be, a, we hope, a lively discussion. Sports betting, gambling is, uh, is a hot topic, especially with the Super Bowl coming. Um, we're going to delve into some issues with mental health and finances. But first, just going to give you a little brief history of, of sports betting in this country. Uh, the history started in the 1600s when the early colonists brought horse racing here. Uh, in the mid-18th century, betting kind of wah, 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 uh, became frowned upon because it lost its appeal. Why? Baptists and Methodists, not judging anybody, considered it a sinful deal. Uh, but you can't keep a good gambler down. Uh, so in the 19th century, sports betting returned with a flourish, attracting a diverse audience uh, from the affluent to the middle class and the poor, among, among the more popular sports, willing to take your money and give it, alligator fighting. <laughs> Hate to see the loser on that one. Uh, eventually, horse racing and boxing swamped the gators. Uh, New Orleans was America's first sports betting and gambling center. Then came New York, then Chicago, then finally Las Vegas, Atlantic City in there too, which uh, Vegas legalized sports betting in 1931. The first sports book appeared inside a Vegas casino in 1975. And in, in 2018, a big date, uh, the Supreme Court struck down the 1992 federal ban on sports betting, after which football, baseball, hockey, basketball changed their anti-betting stance and welcomed wagering with open arms because it meant money. Uh, fast forward to today when you can bet on anything, even how many times CBS will show Taylor Swift during the Super Bowl, over under 13. Uh, a record 67.8 <laughs> million Americans, which is about 26% of the entire population, are expected to wager an estimated 23 billion with a B on Sunday's game. The NFL takes in 2.3 billion in increased revenue because of betting. There's a reason the NFL is the most popular sport in America, and it's not just because catching passes and tackling. Betting and wagering is a huge deal. And with that, let's get the forum going. 
Uh, we're going to discuss topics of interest relating to uh, sports betting in general and in Ohio specifically, cultural impact. We're going to look at financial impact and mental health and addiction among the other topics. So I want to ask the esteemed panelists here, first off, um, what makes sports betting, gambling so popular? Why is this such a big deal for any of you? Uh, all right. Am I doing this right? I was given yeah, instructions fine. in writing and in person on how to hold this microphone. <laughs> and I didn't want to be the first person to mess it up. I was thinking Oyama would mess it up and I could make fun of him later. Okay, so the head of the National Council on Problem Gambling kind of put sports betting in, in a different category than casino gaming in terms of its appeal and allure. And he, he says it's the four A's. So advertising, which is really interesting and, and, and available anywhere. Uh, accessibility on mobile phones, which a lot of young people use. Um, acceptability, where casino gaming is still kind of viewed for other people to do. Sports is a hobby. So that's where your heroes are. And that's what you talk about at lunch, and that's what you talk about at family dinners. And frankly, it's very acceptable. And then the fourth A is action. There is, uh, my guess is with the Super Bowl, we'll have an operator pregame offer more than 400 different types of bets. And so that doesn't even count the in-game proposition bets that they'll offer throughout the game. And so if you want action, you will have action. If you want continual action, you will have continual action. And for the demographic that is the sports better, which is generally males 18 to 35, college educated with disposable income. And, uh, and you can, if you wanted to, bet on sports with the same kind of pace that someone can bet on a slot machine. You know, one of the things that we uh, want to help emphasize here is gambling in our country is over a $400 billion revenue stream for a number of institutions. And it's that dopamine that comes along with that for many who are chasing that game of chance. They're chasing that opportunity. And for some, for some, it's purely entertainment. And we totally get that. It's just an, an opportunity to have a little bit of fun. Uh, some of you may have heard me say this before, the chance to participate in the office lottery pool. Some people do it once or twice a year. Well, there are some people who gamble every single day. And at that juncture, it's not just about fun. It is truly a moderate to really problematic issue for them and it's not just sports betting. Sports betting alone last year raked in over $90 billion in the U.S. Now you heard the stat a little bit earlier, 7.6 billion in the state of Ohio. That's almost 10% of the total national right here in one year. And since then, what we've seen in the very few, very few uh, first weeks when online sports betting went in in 2023, call volumes at Mary Haven quadrupled. Our uh, problem gambling line saw their numbers go up. And as my friend just shared, the primary group, young white men, age 18 to 44, skyrocketed. It's the access on those cell phones. It's the ability to use a credit card and not necessarily think about what is happening every time they place a bet. Again, thin line between those who view it as entertainment and an opportunity to enjoy themselves on occasion. They may go to the casino and play the penny slots. They don't necessarily sit down and play craps, right? But we're talking about folk who every single day habitually cannot walk away from this opportunity and it is chemically induced for them as well. So we try to make sure that we help advocate and provide resources so that they can navigate through it. I'll pick up there. We'll go down the line. Um, how many have been a teenager? <laughs> okay. Or have teenagers or no teenagers? 
The first thing you may think of is not too bright. You know, we'll make mistakes, we'll take a wrong path at some point or at some month or tomorrow and the next day. And, and what has always been a challenge when it comes to a behavior like gambling is you know, their prefrontal cortex, and we're not going to talk about that, but their brain development, it's not done. It, they're not cooked. They're not fully baked. I mean, we all know that. Everybody, everybody understands that. But with something like sports gambling and that, those four A's, that constant available access, they also in many, many, many cases started gambling around the dining room table with grandma and the uncles and you know the family. And there, didn't, there was nothing wrong with that. It was a family behavior. It was something that you know, is healthy and bringing everybody around the dining room table is a wonderful thing. But as we progress through what we see changing in the gambling landscape, we've completely thrown out the occasional opportunities that gambling used to be. Um, high stakes poker didn't happen around the family dining room table. In my house, Appalachia, you'll probably figure that out, it was in the basement, it was men only, and the females were not allowed down there. And chances are nobody walked away with more than, oh, I don't, I'll say $200. I don't know, I wasn't allowed down there. Um, but as these young folks are, you know, growing up already with the gambling culture in their heads, and then sports gambling comes, and they already love football, or they love soccer, or football, or, you know, and, and it could be tennis, and it could be golf, and this is another way to get a thrill from those games, and, and then there's things like bet 500 and, uh, or five dollars and get 200 in additional bets. So it's so tempting and they don't make good decisions. And when we look at our survey data at age 18, we have serious problem gamblers at age 18. Well, that wasn't the flip of a switch. With that, I'll pass it. I think on the um, panel, I'm probably the, the one who is uh, tasked or designated as the sports betting supporter. Um, but one of the things that I think uh, has made it so popular is the fact when you look at how many professional teams there are, how many professional leagues there are, how many college teams there are, and how many college, college leagues there are, what is one thing that all of those teams have in common? It's that they have fans. And when you look at the media landscape and the way that it is now, people going away from cable, going to streaming services where they can sign up to watch whatever team that they, where they went to college, where they currently go to college, whatever professional sport they're interested in, they can go out and buy a subscription to watch that basically whenever they want. That increased access to viewing sports live uh, gives people the incentive to put a little bit more excitement behind it. Um, whether it's watching the Premier League on Saturday morning or watching college football on Saturday afternoon, it's exciting to watch your favorite team. It's even more exciting if you have a little bit of money on the game. And so I think the ability to watch all different kinds of sports uh, for whatever sport that you're interested in and the availability of that on TV to watch it live and to have a little bit more of a stake in it I think makes it extremely attractive, especially for those younger folks who frankly are more tech savvy, who understand, who understand streaming services better instead of just buying basic cable. Uh, they can designate what it is that they want to watch and when they want to watch it. And as a result, I think they are more inclined to uh, add a little bit of excitement to whatever it is that they're watching. You mentioned uh, the breakdown men versus women percentage sports gambling, sports betting. What are those numbers, if you can throw those out, and what's, what's the cultural uh, explanation for that? Why it would seem men, much more than women, are betting on sports? I referenced uh, a gambling survey, and we completed one December 31st of 2022. So that was purposefully cut off before sports gambling became legal. So keep that in mind, we're talking about pre-legal sports gambling in Ohio. 
At that point, we already knew that only 17% of Ohioans were gambling, were not gambling. We knew that 20% of Ohio adults were already at risk based on their gambling behaviors. Low risk, middle risk, high risk, which is probably diagnosable, 255,000 people. When we look at the gender breakdowns over all gambling, it's about 50-50 in Ohio. It was also about 50-50 in 2017. So even though the females weren't allowed in my basement, in Ohio today, we have gender equality when it comes to gambling. Anybody else? One, th one thing, if I, I can just throw in as we're talking about, you know, specifically who's gambling in the state of Ohio and how prevalent sports gaming is. I mean, st sports gaming has been very much alive and well in Ohio for a very long time. And likely with bookies that people knew, particularly where Stacy is from in the Ohio Valley, where it is a family affair after all, um, I didn't know a candy store was really a candy store uh, until I went to Steubenville. And, <laughs> but they had nice offerings. And, and so through the surveys that we've done, um, starting in 2011, every five years after that, what we saw surprised me. It showed that those who choose to engage in sports gambling as their type of gambling activity, have a much higher rate of at-risk or problem gambling behavior than any other type of gambling, including casino gaming. And not much above it, but above it. And yet, when you look at the calls to the helpline, it's negligible who calls in for help with a sports gambling problem. Part of that was because it was illegal. And people would stay in the shadows because they didn't want to come forward and admit that they were engaging in illegal activity. And what we saw and this, I think, contribute to part of the huge spike in calls to the helpline, in particular, uh, when we launched sports gaming, was people finally being able to reach out and talk about it. And anecdotally, a lot of clinicians and treatment professionals also said for the first time they're seeing people walk into their offices that are young and looking for help. And so, you know, if we look at the plus side of legalization, um, being able to come forward and get help and get treatment and talk about this in the light is, has proven to be a very good thing. Let's switch gears here. Um, let's follow the money. Where is the money going to and how much money are we talking? Let's, let's talk financial impact in Ohio specifically. What does sports betting bring in? Is there a cost in treatment? all these things. It's not, it's not all positive, it's all not negative. Well, I can take a crack at that. My agency actually audits all the numbers that come in every month. So as was mentioned before, the seven, over seven billion dollars is how many, much Ohioans wagered, which, I mean, really you do kind of step back and say, wow, seven billion dollars? Where did it all come from, <laughs> right? So. Typically, you know, when it comes to gambling for the business side of this thing, historically, it's been very much a high-risk business to operate with a low hold. So typically for every dollar wagered, a sports book would keep a nickel in profit and with that nickel pay for everything that they need to do. Um, in Ohio's first year, that hold is more like 12%. And and so the amount of revenue that Ohio sports books took in was just over $900 million. So folks said Ohio would be a billion dollar market in terms of revenue to the operators, and it's pretty close. And I think part of that was pumped up by the first month of January with a lot of promotional, the novelty of the game, and we had some pretty important sporting events going on. So we'll see if, uh, I don't think January this year will be like January last year, but it brings in significant money that goes to fund K through 12 education. That's where 98% of the tax, which is 20% on sports gaming goes, and 2% of that goes to help uh, problem sports gaming and addiction services. One of the good things 
is that gambling in and of itself has been recognized as a behavioral health condition that now it allows for the level of treatment that we can provide. Now, that treatment in terms of cost can vary. Let's just face it, what we tend to see is a lot of problem gamblers, they don't want to come in and use their insurance because they fear retribution or retaliation from their employers and or just generalized identification. Some of the people that we treat at Mary Haven, they have been convicted of theft and embezzlement because of how addictive this particular gambling scenario can be for them. So when we're treating individuals, it can be as low as a few thousand dollars for that person based on the number of therapy sessions that they need to embark upon, or it can skyrocket from there because we're talking about family implications, bringing in the entire family unit for levels of services and treatment. Now, one of the great things is in the state, or in this state in particular in Franklin County, we at Mary Haven have a great partnership with our Adam H. Board, and what they've done is they've taken a very innovative approach at this and allowed for any Franklin County resident to receive treatment for free for their gambling addiction. Let's think about that. So exactly what my friend just shared, for a, a period in time, people were reluctant to go in and receive the necessary care that they need, and now we're clearing those barriers for them so that they can go out and continue to be good contributing members of society. But it is a costly venture. For some, on, on statistical average, for men, when it comes to gambling and the losses, it can be anywhere from $40,000 to $100,000. And for most, we don't know it until credit cards are maxed out, they've lost the car, they've lost their job, they've lost their house, whatever those scenarios may be. So we want to make sure that we continue to provide the right level of care for them. Again, we're talking about that moderate to truly problematic gambler, not the casual person that's just in it for entertainment. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I think I would point out and kind of piggybacking off of what Matt had said earlier, um, mentioning um, sort of bringing this out into the light and making it legal and making it regulated to make sure that betters are being treated fairly, um, that operators are operating fairly, um, and that there are consumer protections that are put in place to try to limit um, what is activity uh, where people are getting in over their head. You didn't have those types of things when, you, when people were using bookies. Uh, they took care of things their own unique way. Um, you don't have those things with offshore sports books uh, where it's much easier, and when I say offshore, those that are regulated by Curacao and Costa Rica and other uh, typically uh, Caribbean nations, um, you can set up an account much easier there than you can here, and good luck trying to get paid out if you do happen to win, because typically if you do, you have to take it in the form of a gift card that you can't use anywhere, or you have to take it in the form of Bitcoin. Um, if you're into Bitcoin, maybe that's great, but as someone who has no idea how it works, it, it's not real, uh, not real appetizing or appealing to me. So one of the things that operators are required to do is to have know your customer provisions in place so they know who is signing up to bet, and they are required and continue to offer uh, consumer protections that allow people to set how long they're on an app, how much they're allowed to bet in a day, in a week, a month. Uh, how much they're allowed to deposit in a day, a week, or a month. And these types of protections that are there for the consumer will hopefully lead to them being more responsible uh, betters and, and be able to enjoy the product in a, in a much, much better way because they're not getting in over their head chasing losses and trying to do things that are really impacting their financial health. We've seen the commercials. I'm just curious what any of you think about using celebrities to market sports books, DraftKings, whatever it may be. Is that problematic? Is there no problem with that? Or does this get back to there's, there's safe betting and then there's dangerous betting? I think in, in the case of using celebrities, I think it's a tremendous waste of money, to be honest. I, I don't think that when you look at how people make the decisions on what app to use, a lot of it has to do with bonuses. 
who's offering what bonus at what time. Another has to do with ease of platform. How easy is it to place a bet on the sporting event that they want to place a bet on? Um, another is limits. One of the things that's a little bit um, counterintuitive is that, and maybe it's not counterintuitive, it's maybe part of the business model, is that a lot of sports books don't like people who bet a lot of money. And one of the reasons that they don't is that if they bet a lot of money, there's an excellent chance, or a decent chance, that they know how to win money. And so as a result, a lot of sports books, if you talk to consumers, are the target of complaints because the limits that they put on individual bets are way too low for what it is that they're seeking. And part of the reason for that is because sports books are trying to attract a more recreational better who places lower limit bets because it reduces the exposure and over time through volume and an increased hold, they end up making more money than they do offering action um, to, to higher income um, bettors who stand more of a chance to make more money. So in terms of celebrities, I don't think people sign up because Jamie Foxx or Kevin Hart or Gronk are, are advertising these things. I think they're signing up because of how the app looks, how they can place their bets, and what kind of bonuses they're being offered. I would offer that I do think celebrities have some level of a role in this. The reality is I'm a Ravens fan. I'm a Baltimore Ravens fan. And when I look at and I watch a game, here's the deal. Taylor Swift will go to a show in, her, in, in, in that perspective, and all of a sudden the audience just swells. So depending on the nature of that celebrity, they could actually have an impact on individuals and far greater uh, outcomes than we probably imagine. If Taylor Swift were to endorse one of these apps, I can guarantee you there would be a youthful population that would try to start signing up for those apps. And we have to know that, and we have to understand that, and we have to be prepared for that. So even in January of 2023, when uh, the online sports betting launched, I myself personally received several calls from members in the community who said, hey, listen, my teenage kid just tried to cash out and I didn't even know they signed up for it. So it does have a relative impact. I believe we've since taken all the proper measures to ensure that that doesn't happen again. But the reality is, is we do know that depending on the nature of that celebrity, they could impact sales for that particular app. kind of as mentioned before, a lot more younger people trying this out. Um, and they may, or hopefully the consumer protections are keeping them from signing up prior to turning 18 or 21. Uh, but those, those celebrities, they do appeal to them, absolutely. Uh, I had a conversation with a bunch of clinicians last week and asked them what they're seeing from folks coming in in the last year and several of them spoke about how they had people coming in for clinical care who have only been gambling for one to three months with sports gambling. I mean, that is just putting your toe in the pool and going off the deep end, you know, to put it into that kind of perspective. That's terrifying from someone within the behavioral health system of care. I see a lot of people nodding their heads. Prior to sports gambling, somebody might show up in, for clinical care after seven years, maybe three years, three months, dramatic shift. One of the things I think I, I wanna focus on, because Dan focused on um, how individuals that are of legal age decide to choose a sports book, and I totally agree with everything he said about what those choices are and who influences it. When it comes to celebrities and sports figures, I actually think about those that are 20 and younger and what kind of impact they have on them. Because we know they're sports fans just like their adult siblings and parents are. And when they are watching a game and they see commercials and they see their heroes that are advertising, and athletes live in rarefied air. They are not down here with the rest of us mortals. And there are some celebrities that I think fall into that category as well. And the message that they get is that 
sports gambling is normal, and as soon as you're able to be able to place a wager, you should do so. Because your hero said that this is fun and this is a good thing to do. And their brains aren't developed, and they form a, there's a normalization that occurs that really should not be when they simply don't have the kind of gambling literacy needed to make decisions with money. And what's worse, and this is something that we have tried to push against here in the state of Ohio, which they outlawed in Britain because of the social consequence, is players wearing the logo of the sports books on their jersey. And then those same jerseys with the sports book logo are sold in the gift shop. And they'll say, well, we don't do it in children's sizes. I gotta tell you, my four kids were wearing adult sizes long before they became adults. And that was a ridiculous notion. And so kids are walking around with sports book logos here in the city of Columbus. I'm curious, moving into the mental health uh, side of this, it's probably fair to say, I'd like to hear what the percentage is. Again, not all sports betting appeals to addicts, I guess. What is the breakdown of addiction to just casual recreational sports betting? I think that's an important number. And then for that, for the percent that are addicted or it's an issue, what advice would you give to them, to parents, to people in their lives, um, anyone thinking of betting? What are the red flags? So what's the percentage are we talking about? Because we don't want to talk about anybody who plays fantasy league football is, is addicted and needs treatment. But it is a problem. Can you speak to that? Sure. And some of the numbers I'm talking about are clearly through uh, that survey that cut off on December 31st of 2022. <clears throat> but we haven't seen, we don't anticipate seeing much more of a shift in individuals gambling. At this point, we have 17% of folks not gambling in Ohio. So the vast majority of us are gambling in some way, and that might be buying a lottery ticket every week. But those individuals that would probably be diagnosable with a gambling disorder are 2.8%. That's the 255,000 adults that I mentioned. We're not surveying younger people. There would likely be two or three percent of those under 18 as well that might be diagnosable because they started gaming and using funds and taking chances much, much earlier because of iPads and laptops and so on. When we look at the broader picture, that at-risk level, those folks are about 20 percent, and it's about even less than 2.8 percent, so 17 percent of those folks are either low risk or middle risk. They, they themselves need to think about, I mean, we call it positive play, responsible gambling, paying attention to how much money you're going to spend today. Everybody used to say 20 bucks, and now maybe it's $300. If you can afford $300, I mean, it's all relative. So if you can afford $300 a week, fine. If $300 a day, fine. But you have to set a budget, a limit on time and money. And if you're that person who cares, pay attention to that. Is there lost time? Have you not seen, I'll say your husband, but it could be your spouse, your significant other, for big chunks of time? Are you not seeing your 22-year-old son every weekend like you used to? You know, where are they? Where are they spending their time? And maybe they hit you up for a loan a little more than they used to. Think about, we have an a incredible website called, called pausebeforeyouplay.org. Shameless plug, pausebeforeyouplay.org. And there's tons of resources there, as well as a two-minute quiz. And you could always say, you know, hey, John, something going on with you? You might want to go to pausebeforeyouplay.org and take the quiz. I'll stop. So Mary, Mary Haven launched the first gambling addiction treatment recovery program in the state of Ohio. 
uh, back in 2009. And since then, it has been nationally recognized. And so one of the things that I would offer up is to not pass judgment. Do not pass judgment on that individual. Instead, help them get help. And the best way you can do that is to reach out via the 800 number. You can certainly call us at Mary Haven, visit us at maryhaven.com, and we can get them connected. But there are plenty of signs out there that can help you get at least some beat on what exactly is probably playing out with that individual. Constantly nervous, constantly maxed out on credit cards, always asking to borrow money, those kinds of things. Uh, certainly if they've lost their job, lost their home, if they are always asking about the office pool, uh, there's a number of different signs that exist out there. Some are very subtle, some are a little bit more overt, uh, but when you do, we often ask, just don't pass judgment. Uh, get them in contact with those who are very capable of walking through recovery and treatment programs with them to help them get their lives back on track. We have been incredibly successful in helping people turn their lives around and ultimately re-engage with their families and or back into the employment community. You know, there are some really interesting stats that we have to think about here. For problematic gamblers, gamblers this means the more acute gamblers, what we've often found too is that one out of two of them tend to be domestic abusers. And so when we're talking about working with the family, we're not talking about just treating the gambling addiction. We're talking about a holistic approach on how we can help them reestablish themselves and navigate for them what could be an incredibly new world. We have to wrap up here. Uh, we're gonna have one more question, but first, if part of the DNA of this organization, CMC, is to have audience participation, Q&A. So if you have a question, Make your way back to Doug, he's in the back of the room, and after we uh, ask this question and, and, and they speak on it, we'll have the Q&A, and if you're online, type your question into the chat, and Doug will get that too. So here's, here's the last question. Where does it end, and, and is escalation of sports betting inevitable? Typically what we see um, in other states that have what we call a more mature market, states like New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan that have been around for several years, you will see uh, the numbers uh, gradually go up and then at some point they become more predictable. Um, one of the things we have seen in Ohio is that we have lost operators um, or seen a decrease in interest of operators uh, since the launch, and we'll continue to see that. Part of that um, has to do with the license fees, uh, part of it has to do with the competitive market, and part of it has to do, or will have to do, with the doubling of the tax rate um, from 10% to 20% that, that happened after six months. So eventually what you're going to see are fewer operators, I think, um, because of all of those factors, and I think what you will also start to see are those operators who do come into the market are going to offer what we would call a differentiated product, something that looks different uh, than your typical sports betting app. Um, consumers aren't really looking for 15 versions of the same thing. Uh, what they are looking for are new and innovative ways um, to do the activity uh, that they're already doing. So eventually I think you will start to see operators leave the state uh, and I think those that will come in will look much different um, than the typical market leaders that you see right now. What we are monitoring over at Mary Haven, and I'm certain uh, our partners over at Omos are doing the same, is we're trying to make sure we get a good understanding of any co-occurring conditions that can exist along with gambling. So for instance, now that we have recreational marijuana use here in the state, uh, we may actually see some increase of clientele wanting to come in and receive treatment and or therefore uh, possibly engaging more in the gambling space based up, again upon the types of substances they may choose to use. So these are the things that we're constantly just trying to keep a, a barometer on to better understand what can ultimately happen with the citizens here in the state and what we can do both on preventive side and on treatment side to help those who find themselves in despair and in need. If you don't mind, I just want to take one thing to say, there's actually a real positive opportunity here because 
everybody's betting online. 98% of all wagers are online. That's where it's happening. And all the operators have a ton of data on their individual users, what they like, what they don't like, when their behavior starts to change. And we are working on a project in coordination with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to work with a company out of the UK who's done this over there to take neuroscience, to take technological experts, gambling experts, and treatment experts, and design an app and deploy that in with each operator's app. And we have willing operators who are gonna work with us on this and be able to customize their experience so that the communication on their betting comes directly to them. It's tailored to them. It's put in words that don't push them away, but draw them in. And this, is a, this will be a really unique thing here in the state of Ohio, and I hope it gets pushed out further, that the same, the same data with AI can really be used to help people as much as it can be used to manipulate them. You had to, you had to drop the AI thing on us, didn't you? I knew it, I knew it. Uh, it's time for a Q&A. Uh, Doug, do you, does anyone have questions? Go ahead and move to the back and he will hand you the mic. And we ask you that uh, you keep it relatively short and a question is not a statement. So let's keep right. it to questions. They end with a question mark. Rob, thank you very much and thank you to today's panelists. Uh, so to kick us off, let's see if I can uh, untangle this one a little bit. Um, thinking about the $7 billion placed on bets in Ohio and working backwards, is there data about where exactly that money comes from? Is it just individual bettors making small bets or is something else happening? In other words, there is an organized business of taking bets. Is there an organized business of making bets? So I think in terms of where the money comes from, there's a couple of things I, I'm not sure that we, we hit on. One, um, we've mentioned the bonus bets. We've mo mentioned promotional, um, promotional uh, funds or promotional bets that are made. Uh, that money is factored in um, to that number. And so the way that the state of Ohio treats it is that that is um, gaming revenue that the operator is generating even though it's the operator's money. So for example, if you bet $5 and then you get $150 in bonus bets, and let's say you bet 155 total, the state of Ohio taxes you as taxes the operator as on their 20% as if that $150 was actual money, which it is not. And so then you have to factor in the money that is also paid out. So when we hear the gaming revenues that are cited, um, there are instances in where operators are paying out more in promotional revenue than they're actually making and therefore losing money month to month. Uh, when you especially factor in the 20% tax rate, the 10% federal excise, uh, the commercial activity tax, 0.26% of your gross revenues, it ends up being a lot that the operator ends up paying out um, and is not actually realizing. So in terms of where that money is coming from, how the bets are being made, a lot of that is spurred on by um, the promotions that the operators are offering and then people supplementing that with their own money. Um, we don't really have syndicates here in Ohio for a variety of reasons where people pool their money and bet in large amounts, um, especially if they're not able to legally bet. Um, but it, it's something where the operators and the incentives that they offer are what spur people more often than not to actually place the bets that are being factored into the gross gaming um, and net taxable revenue. Hi, Doug Buchanan with uh, Columbus Business First. I think the main difference for me between your traditional candy store bookie and these apps is your bookie was not offering uh, action on the, a random tennis match in Uzbekistan between the you know, 400th and 300th ranked player, but these apps are, and uh, you mentioned AI, um, they just, it feels like they're not actually setting odds, they're just setting inducements to get people to bet. So they're not really sports betting apps, they're just addiction apps. I, I just don't understand how that fits with know your customer 
rules where you're supposed to be you know, throttling that down or setting the limits? I'll give Dan a break because he, <laughs> <laughs> poor guy has to be the one to speak for the industry on all of this. I mean, to, to start with, the state of Ohio said all of what you just said is legal to do. And so you start with it has been um, green-lighted by the General Assembly. When you mention the tennis matches and obscure players that no one has ever heard of, that's for the person that wants to just bet. That's for the person that wants the action. That's the person that's most likely going to be doing at-risk behavior because they need something to bet on. They need the thrill. And so when you get past actually what's the, the bread and butter of sports books, which is NFL season and March Madness, and you get into really anything else, um, the further you go down the line into the most obscure sports is just purely placed there for people that are going to bet because they're compelled to do so. And it's the, what, the operators also, I'm gonna give them credit on this, we require them to do this by rule, they are supposed to already be looking at their customer's behavior to see if there are changes in that behavior that would lead to information that could lead to an intervention or could lead to suspended accounts. Um, what we're trying to do with our project is to take that and make it uniform across the state of Ohio so everyone's getting the best in class um, product to be able to do this sort of thing. But those, those, I would consider, if there's a red flag on bets on that app, the tennis ones, ping pong, those are the ones you look at and you just, you just kind of shudder. Thank you. Um, Kermit Morse asks, how many or what percentage of gamblers in Ohio are using the limits? And I might also add to that, uh, can you tell us about the Time Out Ohio program? I'll be happy to talk about Time Out Ohio. Okay. Uh, there was a voluntary exclusion program prior to what is now Time Out Ohio. And what Mental Health and Addiction Services, but mostly the Lottery Commission and Casino Control Commission have been able to put into place now is that it is a one-stop shop for Ohioans who want to limit their gambling, uh, you know, who want to stop themselves or at least prevent themselves from entering casinos, from sports gambling, um, and all of that is possible with one application. It's online now. It used to be you had to go somewhere and fill it out. Uh, you know, it's very simple, and you can limit yourself for one year, five years. Is a lifetime still on time? And up to a lifetime. Those can all be appealed at this point after the first year, after five years. And that way, you know, it's, it's, it's a customer protection piece. And it's something that the gambler, him or herself, has control over to the extent that they, they make that choice for themselves. They cannot be coerced to do that. Um, that. Who knows what happens behind closed doors. But they are saying, you know, I am doing this because I want to do this, and I'm stepping back for a year. I'm stepping back for five years. It's timeoutohio.com or org. I think it's com. <laughs> Another, an add-on to that. So when we saw mobile betting coming, we wanted to make sure that solutions and tools were available online and we weren't just relying on the same old, same old. So to complement the Time Out Ohio program, we also offer anyone who wants it a downloadable app to up to five devices that will ban them, once it's downloaded and it can't be taken off for a year, it will not let your device access over 66,000 legal and illegal gambling sites around the world that are constantly updated. So if a person really wants to make sure, because Time Out Ohio will keep them from going in the door or playing on an app here in the state of Ohio, but it won't stop them from using an illegal app like Bovada that's very popular, but this app will, and it's free, and it's uh, available on our website. I'm John Lowe. Um, addiction has always been a little bit elusive. Uh, it's hard to define an alcoholic or a shopaholic or a drug addict in terms of being really precise about it. Uh, and the question is whether there's something internal, uh, he has something, or is it simply something he or she does? Uh, in other words, addictive behavior. 
I'm wondering what you folks think about that. Do you consider it there being something internal? And, and do you have a working definition of a gambling addict? That's a great question. A gambling addict is, is someone who is driven by compulsive behaviors that negatively impact them, but they still are not able to stop. I'll say, for me, it's chocolate. It's, you know, it, it's destructive, I'm diabetic. I had five, um, maybe six, uh, Hershey's Kisses yesterday, shouldn't do it. You know, and and uh, not to make light of it, when we're talking about, when we're talking about alcohol, when we're talking about substance use disorder of any kind, and you know, when you look at brain scans of someone high on coke and brain scans of someone in the midst of a gambling spree, they look the same. Everything's lit up. You know, their brains are completely engaged. So with substance use disorder, it's easy to say, you can see the chemical reaction in the brain. It actually looks the same for someone who is addicted to gambling. The medical term is gambling disorder at this point. It used to be compulsive gambling, pathological gambling, but it is treatable. You know, there is clinical care for that. There are evidence-based practices to help that individual to get them to be gambling free or in long-term recovery as there is for other addiction issues. It is free across the state of Ohio with the taxes that we receive um, from the 7.6 billion and a lot of other gambling funds that come in based on tax dollars. Uh, and I would say, you know, we all have a role in that. One thing that hasn't been mentioned, not to end on a downer, but that ultimate outcome for some people is suicide when we're talking about this issue. So if you have doubts or questions about someone that you know, speak up. Just, just to, to, to bring this in full context, if you can, by show of hands, how many of you enjoy a nice hot, poppy, a hot cup of coffee in the morning, right? How many of you have more than one cup a day? Three cups a day. Do you know it's one of the leading drivers of addiction outside of sugar is caffeine? And we all have it, right? In some way, shape, or form. And so think about the person that's also wrestling with gambling addiction. Think about the person that's wrestling with any other type of substance use disorder. For them, if they step away from it for a long time, they can be absolutely fantastic. But the minute they take a sip of that coffee, they're back on and they're addicted. Think about the withdrawal you went through the minute you decided that you weren't going to drink another cup of coffee. That same chemical composition happens for substance use disorder and gambling and certain levels of mental health. And just to tack onto that, why it's so important, you know, it's 3% of the population, it's 250,000 people, which is five times the size of my hometown of Mansfield, which I would think would be a crisis if that five towns had a problem. The problem is that gambling addiction is the most lethal. And there are more suicides related to a gambling addiction than any other type of addiction in the United States. It's a lethal disease and people don't see it, you know? Scott Anderson at OMAS always says, you know, people don't have blackjack breath, you know, or bloodshot eyes because of craps. And um, anyways, because of the lethal nature of this is why we're taking this so seriously and just as seriously as we would anything involving opiates or alcohol. And oh, by the way, when people with a gambling addiction, they tend to have a co-occurring disorder. So it's not just gambling, it's probably also alcoholism or many other problems. Great. We're gonna turn it back over to Matt, one more question. We have uh, about two minutes for one more question. Um, and I'm gonna ask it because it's the title of today's forum and it's uh, Carol Mary on the online audience wants to know. So, did Ohioans win or lose by legalizing sports betting? I guess I'm probably biased, um, but um, I'm gonna say for those who have been participating in sports betting one way or another uh, for years, who have wanted the opportunity to do it, to do it legally, I think some of the framework that we have um, through statute and through rules allows them to do it in a responsible way 
where they know they're going to get paid if they win, and they can put on meaningful uh, limits to make sure that they don't lose too much. I think Matt knows probably more than he wants to that I have ideas on ways to change it. Um, but I think that overall, when you're taking an industry that has been existing for so long illegally and bringing it into the light and allowing it to be regulated in a way that consumers are protected, I think it's a win for the state. And I, in a rare move, going to agree with Dan and say, with the two choices of leaving it as was in the black market versus bringing it into the light with resources and clear communication, whether one likes, likes gambling, doesn't like gambling, um, the fact of the matter is Ohio is doing the right thing because we've been doing this for, for probably since we started in 1803, I'm sure. After they got done signing the Constitution at Worthington's house, they started to gamble. And it, the fact of the matter is there is much more for the citizens of the state of Ohio through regulated, legalized gambling with a lot of resources that we can credit the General Assembly with that have the foresight to give us the tools and the people the tools who have a problem to be able to deal with that and other folks to operate in a safe, controlled environment. Gambling is not new, and we recognize that. But what we also recognize, the win for us, is that we have great institutions in the community, great partners, great boards out there that are willing to help step up and ensure that those who are in need are getting the necessary treatment. Great. Matt, so over to you. Well, thank you, Rob. Thank you, panel, uh, for an enlightening discussion. I mean, I mean, I'm one of the many that that sports gamble as well, not very well. Um, but I, I mean, I hate losing money, so I, I can't get it. I just won't get addicted because losing money is even more painful. Um, but I, I do, I do appreciate your guys' candor and your honesty in terms of how complex this is. It's not just as simple as winning and losing money. Uh, sometimes it is about losing lives as well. So we have to make sure we keep an eye on that as well. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the generous sponsors of today's forum, Mary Haven Incorporated, the Problem Gambling Network of Ohio, as well as Taft Law. Uh, of course, the Columbus Dispatch, the Ellis, our online seat patrons, the Center for Human Kindness and th at the Columbus Foundation, and the Dispatch again for presenting our live stream. And then a very special appreciation to today's panelists one more time for Dan Dodd, Stacey Front Applehassan, Oyama Garrison, Matt Schuler, and our host Rob Owl. Give them a round of applause. Uh, 49ers are going to win, correct? Right? Yep. Yep. Okay. We don't have to bet on that. We can just say that out loud for fun. Uh, and we're tired of the Chiefs. That's all. And I can't believe you root for the Ravens anyways. Oh, yeah, what's wrong with you? We're in Ohio. Um, anyways, please register now to attend next Wednesday's forum, Understanding the New Landscape of Child Care. That's right here at the Ellis next Wednesday. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine. We'll see you next time. <laughs>